I think a lot of times when we look at our relationship with Jesus, we ask that question. Is this really a relationship that gives all year? Or is it just the Jelly of the Month Club? I think it's a good question for us to ask. As we're asking these questions in this series, is Christmas make-believe? That has to be one of the best questions that we can ask. Is what Jesus claims to give through the story of Christmas a gift that keeps on giving the whole year? Or is it just this promise of this moment in our life and in our relationship with the religion that says, hey, there's a moment that's transformative, that changes the way you think a bit, changes the way you behave, but that's really it. The gift happens in a moment, and that's it. Or is there something beyond that? Is there something that's extended in this? Is, is Jesus really a God, the Son of God? And if so, is there something beyond a moment in this relationship? Probably you're not your typical Christmas passage. If you came this morning thinking, man, we're going to hear the, the story of Jesus and his birth, we're going to get to it, but we're not going to start there. I want to start with a claim that is made on behalf of God that gives you some insight into what God sees as his Christmas gift. He says this in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. If you ask God, is this relationship, is this Christmas gift one that keeps on giving the whole year? He would say, no. The gift I want to give you is the gift that keeps on giving forever. It never ends. The, sus the subscription never stops. It never expires. The gift is to not perish, but to have eternal life. To hold it tangibly. Not to think about it, not to dream about it, not to have this in our hopes and our desires, but to tangibly hold it, grasp it in our hands, in our being, eternal life. The gift that keeps on giving I'd be honest, when I was growing up, the best kind of gifts to, get, gifts to get were the double gifts. You know what I'm talking about? So, like, you're sitting in a circle with all the, all the people, and somebody's being Santa Claus, and they're handing out, with, you know, all the presents. And then every once in a while, you had an aunt or an uncle or grandmother or someone that got you your gift, but it was, it was actually two gifts. And so you got two presents on the same gift. They were, like, tied together in a string. Everybody else just got one because their gift only had one part to it. But your gift was two, and so it was like, hey, in fact, my son actually did this last night. Like, I was sitting there thinking about it, watching him. Everybody else got four presents, but he was like, I got five. And, of course, all of the kids were like, why did he get five? I mean, he gets in a lot of trouble. Why is he getting five? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You know, but that's what it was. The gift had two parts to it, you know? And those are the greatest gifts to get. Jesus, believe it or not, the gift of Christmas, the gift that God wants us to get, to receive, not only is like a double gift, there's many gifts that come attached to the central gift of Christmas. If you came this morning thinking, hey, I, I just wanted to hear the birth story of Jesus, we're going to do that. But as we're walking through it, just kind of briefly, I'm going to try to hustle through it. As we're hustling through it, I want you to kind of listen a little bit for those double gifts, triple gifts. And I'm going to break it down with people who are really interacting with Jesus. The folks that we have really looked into the first three weeks of this series asking the question, is Christmas make-believe? And see if you can find them. We'll start with Luke chapter 2 and the shepherds. Here it comes. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. 
An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. If you were here earlier in the series, you know we spent an entire week talking about the people and personhood of the shepherds. We talked about the idea that shepherds, honestly, being the first guests at the birth of Jesus, they were probably the most disgraceful people that could have, that have, could have shown up at the manger scene. When you have a royal birth as followers of Jesus, we see Jesus being born as a king, as the son of God. And when royal births happen, you don't invite the guys that are outside of the city tending the sheep. They're not the people that come in and greet the baby for the first time. Westminster Abbey rings bells. There are heralds that shout out the windows and tell them that it's a boy, everyone in the kingdom. But shepherds don't get to be in the birthing room shortly after. They're not the first people that lay eyes on the new baby king. That's not who they are. But for Jesus, they were. He was a gift given even to the people of disgrace because he wanted us to know that all of us have a little disgrace in us. And he came for each one of us. Luke 2, 16. The angels talk to them and and then we pick up with what the shepherds do. It says, so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Did you hear that? They actually found Mary and Joseph. Like as they were hustling down the street, I don't know if they've got their little shepherd's crooks with them. I don't know if they're hitting each other as they're going. I'm not sure if they're sprinting or they're doing a fast power walk. I'm not sure how they're getting down the street, but they're looking everywhere. They're looking like, oh, he's got a manger. Let's go in there. Oh, he's got a manger. There's some animals in there. Eventually they find them. They actually find the Virgin Mary. Process that for a second. Like literally. Not figuratively in a manger scene when we want to go see a lot of nativity, we're like, oh, we saw Mary. They did a really good job. She was a great Mary. I think she looks just like a virgin. I don't know how that works. Right? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, that probably came out wrong. You know what I'm saying? But you know what I'm saying. Like it didn't happen that way. It happened really. Like he, they really found the virgin Mary, not her face on a piece of toast. You know what I'm saying? Like the actual, the actual virgin Mary and Joseph. And Jesus, like the real baby Jesus, the real one, they were welcomed into the birthing room, strangers, shepherds, poor, a disgrace. They found the real Jesus, the real Mary, the real Joseph. They are forever linked to the Son of God. On the day that for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son. The shepherds, not Mary and Joseph's parents, not the governor or the mayor, not the innkeeper, not the rich and the wealthy and the to-dos, shepherds. I'll bet the shepherds felt like family. I'll bet as they sat there and realized there's no one else coming but us. I'm sure it processed in their mind. You mean the angels only told us about this? We must be family. On this side of history, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you know just how much of a family they were. For Jesus came so that we could be adopted as sons and daughters into the family of God. 
You see, the shepherds, they received there in their own viewing with their own eyes the real Jesus. But Jesus is that special gift, that double gift, triple gift. Jesus comes as the primary gift, but there's other gifts attached to him. And when the shepherds showed up into the birthing room, into the birthing stable, you see, they were given a second gift. The shepherds were given a place to belong in the story of the kingdom of God. The shepherds were given a place to belong in the story of the kingdom of God. Mary, we'll pick up in Luke chapter 1. Listen for her gift. 126. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, that's her cousin, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered, What kind of greeting might this be? But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Oh, to find favor with God. He says, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. What must that feel like? For God to look upon us and for him to find favor with us? When you woke up this morning, was that something that processed in your mind? God has favor on me. God has found favor in me. Did that cross your mind this morning? I think as followers of Jesus, it probably ought to be something we should consider. If not obviously by our own merits and the things we've accomplished ourselves, but because of our connection to Jesus, he then looks upon us and finds favor in us. And there are still moments while not our entire person pleases God because we make mistakes. But there are those incredible moments when we dive into the personhood of Jesus, where we actually become Jesus in the flesh for these moments of generosity and giving, where people look at us and they see the very you know, son of God living out his purpose in our hands and feet. In those moments, surely we find favor with God. What must that have been like to hear it from an angel? Even beyond that, to be chosen. I don't know how God chose Mary. Obviously, he had to put a decent amount of thought into it. But of all the people in all the world, you might have thought, well, I mean, Remember week one, we said it was just maybe a coincidence that 700 years before Jesus arrived, two different people talked about the place and the person of the mother giving birth. 700 years before Jesus was born, they said the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem, this teeny tiny podunk town of like 150, 200 people. That's where the next king, like son of God, is going to be born in that little town. 700 years ahead of time. And then 700 years ahead of time, they said, oh, and by the way, she's going to claim to be a virgin when she has this kid. Right? That's what she's going to say. 700 years ahead of time. And so we already know that God already had the plans going 700 years beforehand about how this was going to play out. How does he choose her? What must it feel like to be chosen by God for a very specific task, a very specific role, that ushers in the gift of Christmas. Did you hear Mary's bonus gift? Just like everyone else, she received Jesus. But did you hear what else she received with him? You see, Mary was given an actual connection to God. Like a real life, 
physical connection to God. That's a pretty incredible gift. That's unbelievable. And that's what Mary received. So you have the shepherds given a place to belong in the story of the kingdom of God. And you have Mary given an actual connection to God. And then you have Joseph. And Joseph, we pick up in Matthew chapter 1. But after he had considered this, uh, to give you a little context, Joseph hears Mary's pregnant. She's not buying into she's a virgin thing. She's buying, he's buying into you're a liar. That's what he's bought into at this moment. And he's like, I know how these things happen. And you don't, you don't have little babies in your belly if you're a virgin. That's not how this works. And so he, that's what he's decided. So he's going to divorce her uh, right now. That's what he's thinking. And so that's where we pick up in Matthew 1. Uh, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Did you hear that? Joseph gave him the name Jesus. Jesus. So now the angel tells both Mary and Joseph, hey, you need to call him Jesus. But the the, the scriptures, the Bible only tells us Joseph actually is the one who said, hey, and your name's going to be Jesus. What we see there is we see obedience. We see buy-in. but We also see this connection that's going to grow between Joseph and Jesus. We fast forward a number of years and we learn that Jesus becomes a carpenter. That's the trade of Joseph. Obviously, they spent hours together in the shop and Joseph taught him what he knew. Can you imagine teaching the guy who knows everything, everything you know? Let that sink in for a moment. Yet his love for his son grew so much that just because his son had greater knowledge, that desire to pass on what he was passionate about, it continued and it was manifested and it grew. He gave him the name Jesus. Joseph received his wife, he became a husband. But beyond that, Joseph became a father. Let that process for a moment. Joseph was given the responsibility of being dad to Jesus. You see, Joseph was given a calling with real purpose in the kingdom of God. That was Joseph's bonus gift. Up until then, Joseph was a devout follower of God. And so surely he worshiped, it was in good standing with the temple, followed through in all the ritualistic ceremonies that a Jewish person, a Jewish male would go through. And so he was there, but he was just simply a part of a nation, a nation waiting on a savior. And then suddenly the savior gets ready to appear and God says, hey, not only am I going to give you Jesus, I'm going to give you a very specific calling with a real specific purpose in the kingdom of God. It's going to be husband to the Virgin Mary, father to Jesus Christ, son of God. That changes the outlook on the life in front of you, doesn't it? All of a sudden, Joseph had his plans. Joseph had his life plan. Joseph understood. He he already was betrothed, engaged. He understood what the next years looked like for him. He had hopes and dreams and desires and all those things. And then God shows up and says, hey, I know you're excited about your plan, but wait until you hear what I've got for you. I've got calling and a purpose in the kingdom of God. 
Man, that's a great place to be. That's an incredible bonus gift. I get Jesus, that's amazing. But then I'm included, I have a purpose and a calling in the kingdom of God. Man, if we were to summarize these bonus gifts, the shepherds, they receive belonging. Mary receives connection. And Joseph receives his calling and a purpose. They had no idea they were the recipients of the gift that keeps on giving. For them, they thought, oh, this is just a one-time thing. Jesus will be born, and then my, my part's over. They had no idea what was coming. They had no clue what was waiting for them. You see, one thing just leads to another. The gift of Jesus leads to so many other gifts. If we were to narrow it down into a timeline, here they are. See if you can just follow along. I think we're going to put this on the screen as we go. The result of God giving was the birth of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, right? The result of God giving was the birth of Jesus. The birth of Jesus, the result of the birth of Jesus was actually the death of Jesus. The reason that he was born was so that he could die. Now, there was a lot of things that happened in between, but that was the purpose. Hey, I'm, there's a start here because there's a finish to something, right? And that finish, the death of Jesus, simply led to, led to another beginning. The birth of Jesus leads to the death of Jesus. The death of Jesus leads to the resurrection of Jesus. Resurrection was important because not only was he giving gifts out in terms of uh, like, you know, hey, belonging and connection and purpose and calling, all those things. In addition to that, he wanted to give every single person a gift. Where he said, hey, I want to give you the ability with me to conquer sin and death. That's a gift. And so a resurrection had to happen, but a resurrection couldn't happen unless death happened. And death couldn't happen unless the birth happened. One thing simply leads to another. The resurrection of Jesus leads to the Great Commission. Oh, this incredible moment where Jesus says, I've got so many things to give you, but right now I just want to narrow it down into the one small, simple phrase. And then there's this incredible gift coming in a few days. But right now, let me give you kind of just the outline of what's happening. Go. Go into the whole world. Make disciples. Make people like you who follow me. And I want you to do it in two things. I want you to teach them everything I've taught you. and Baptize them. Go make disciples. That great commission left people in wake because they're like, ah, it's a big commission. That's a big commandment. The great commission then leads to the great equipping or the day of Pentecost, the day that the church was given birth to, the day the Holy Spirit shows up and says, hey, I know you're wondering, how are we going to pull this off? Well, I've got a gift for you. The gift is the Spirit of God. And I'm here to make sure that you can put this gift to use. And I'll lead you through it. The great equipping leads to a gift you experience week in and week out if you're a follower of Jesus. That's the church. The church is given birth to on that day of equipping. And finally, the church produces you and me. The result of God giving was the birth of Jesus. The birth of Jesus to the death of Jesus. Death of Jesus to the resurrection of Jesus. Resurrection of Jesus to the Great Commission. The Great Commission to the Great Equipping. The Great Equipping to the church. The church to you and me. And here we are, a few days before Christmas, hoping to wrap our minds around the gift that keeps on giving. You see, the church, maybe you notice something. I asked a question a few days ago on Facebook. I don't often do these questions uh, to use in uh, my message, but I, just, I was curious. 
Before I told you what I thought, I just wanted to hear what many of you thought. And so a ton of people responded, which is great. And I just simply asked, what's the greatest gift the church can give you? And in return, what's, what's the greatest gift you can give to the church? Not necessarily foundation, because there's a lot of people that don't go to foundation. They're friends with me on Facebook. So just in general, for their church, and what's the, what can the church give to them? And I would, I, would, I would tell you, you should go and read some of the responses. You should go read some of the responses that people left on the post. I'll leave it up. I'm not going to take it down. Some really incredibly thoughtful things. But you know something that I saw over and over and over and over again? People, people were looking for a place in the story, significance, that they matter in the kingdom of God. They were looking for real connection to God. They're looking for purpose and calling. If you go read them, that's what they were looking for. Some of the people that responded, they go, they go y'all go to church here. A lot of people that didn't. There are some people on there I know don't go to church. In fact, there's a few on there I've had conversations that there's not a chance on the planet that they're stepping in church this weekend. They're done with church. It's interesting, though, that what people want, I think, are the three things that the church continues to give. I think it also just so happens to be the things that the shepherds and Mary and Joseph received the first Christmas. When the shepherds, they were given a place to belong in the story of the kingdom of God. When Mary was actually giving, given a connection to God. When Joseph was given a calling with a real purpose in the kingdom of God. The church today continues to be a place where you can belong from day one. When we planted foundation in January of 2018, that's what we said. That as we read the authors of the Bible, that's what we see. We see a desire for every single lost city and the lost people that are in the city to come to know Jesus. And the very first church planter understood that you can't expect people who don't know Jesus to act like they know Jesus. And so we offer a place of belonging before you ever believe or before you ever behave in a way that a follower of Jesus would. And we don't put a timetable on how long it should take for you to begin to believe or behave. For some people, it takes a really, really long time. For others, it's the first time they hear it. And we're flexible either way because we're just providing the opportunity. That's the job of the church. The church continues to be a catalyst for genuine connection to the Most High God. That it's not just enough for us to give you a place to belong among other followers of Jesus or among non, non-believers or non-followers of Jesus. That's not enough. The church has to be a place where we say, hey, if we're really going to be the bonus gift, the, a part of this, this gift that keeps on giving, if we're really going to be the bride of Christ, if we're really going to fulfill this mission, then we have to do more than just give you a place to have relationships and friends with people. We have to provide opportunities for you to seek out and find real connection with God. We hope that that happens on Sunday mornings. But I'll tell you where it happens most is in the community when we're serving. So many times, some of our greatest stories don't happen in these walls in this auditorium. Some of the greatest stories of God moving is when people stepped out of these walls and stepped into the lives of other people. That's why we say people are our destination. Church is never our destination. People are. So the church has to be and continue to be that place. The church continues to leverage her role as the bride of Christ to help others discover their calling and purpose in the kingdom of God. 
In other words, it's not enough for us to give you a place to belong and to create relationships and friends. It's not even enough for us to give, in addition to that, a place for you to find connection with God. We also have to provide a place where you can discover your purpose and calling inside of the kingdom of God. Because it's in those moments you become Joseph, where you wake up one morning with a plan of this is what my life will be, and then suddenly God interrupts it and says, hey, I've got something even greater for you. Regardless of how old you are, whether you're just starting off in your adult life or you're well into your adult life, that God can show up at any moment and say, hey, I know you have a plan, but would you listen to mine? Because mine's going to have a significant impact in the kingdom that I'm building on earth. And if you say yes, if you say yes, then the relationships that happen in community for belonging, then the opportunities that you're given to have a real connection with God that produces the opportunity for you to leverage your gifts and talents and skills in a way that connects to the story of the kingdom. The bottom line, at the end of the day, here's the bottom line. When the church is at its best, you become a gift. I'm not sure if that's what you wanted to hear this morning. I don't know if you wanted to come and say, hey, I I can't wait to hear about this baby Jesus gift that was given to us in a manger. That's fine. We talked about it. And that's true. If you don't know Jesus, that's it. But let me go ahead and tell you how the story progresses. It's not a momentary event. It's not a single thing. The whole idea of Jesus coming and the birth and the resurrection and the death and all those things culminate into this place that says, hey, you are supposed to become a gift to your world. And Jesus can make you that. You want to wake up and find favor with God, figure out a way to be a gift to the people around you. That's Christmas. That's Christmas. And what a great Christmas that we celebrate the birth of Jesus that leads to the birth of a gift that keeps on giving, and we become part of the gift that keeps on giving. That's incredible. Maybe you're thinking, I haven't thought of myself as a gift to anyone in a long time. Maybe you're thinking, actually, I feel more like a burden than anything. Or or maybe you're thinking, honestly, I've just taken a lot. I receive a lot of gifts. And I'm just a a consumer. I'm just a taker. Let, Let me go back to the beginning for a moment and just dial this in with you for a second. If you feel worthless... In fact, let's just take it a step further. Um, if, if everybody would just for a second, think of a word that, that, is, that describes you in a way that's not a gift. And you, all of you probably have one. You have this one word, whatever it might be. And, and, and maybe you think this is what I am, right? I, I'm just this. And this, this, when I wake up in the morning, this thing is on my mind. I can't fix it. I can't, I can't do anything about it. I could do anything about it. I'm not willing to put the work in. Whatever it is, whatever that one word, one single word is, that you wish you could change. Whatever that word is, right? Whatever that word is, just keep it, hold it in your mind, maybe put it in your hand. Put that word in your hand. Take it in your mouth, put it in your hand, hold it tight. Don't let anybody see it. I'm gonna read it to you again. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. Whatever, whatever you got in your hand, whatever that word is, or maybe you didn't put it in your hand, you still got it in your mouth. Whatever that word is, the so takes care of it. If it was just, for God loved the world, you know, God, God loved the world and he gave us one. But it, well, that's not it. For God so loved the world. Well, whatever that word is, the so takes care of it. He, because in his mind, he was thinking, you know what, if you were just like normal, if you were normal and fine and average and all those things, then God loving the world would be enough. But God said, you know what, but there's going to be words that they put in their mind that makes them think that they're worthless or that they can't achieve this or they can't, uh, you know, uh, 
graduate into this, whatever those things are. It says, hey, these are my barriers and my barricades, my obstacles. He says, I know they're going to have them, and so I'm going to so love them to bring them to a place that says, hey, whatever that word is, I so love you, and I knew you had the word in your mouth before you put it there. As that so was covering you, he says, hey, this covers your word and 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 all of your words, whatever it is that convinces you, you can't be a gift. He says, I so loved you. If you feel insignificant, maybe this helps. We keep reading. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He didn't have a bunch. He wasn't like, you know what? Uh, I can live without you. You go ahead. You know? He only had one. Just one single, solitary son. And he had that one son for eternity. So it's not like he can make another one and it'd be the same because he's got an eternity of memories with the other one that actually was there from the beginning. It just wouldn't be the same, you know? And he said, hey, I've got this eternity of memories with my son, and I'm going to give him. If you ever feel insignificant, remember, God so loved, and he gave his only son for you. So that you could receive a gift, and in turn, would make you into a gift. Maybe you're asking, but why does this matter? Why does this matter on Christmas? It matters so much on Christmas. Man, let me tell you why it matters on Christmas. We're just going to read it right out of the Bible. Matthew says it this way. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? Jesus is talking about himself. Who do the people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others say Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Did you hear what happened at the end? Did you hear what happened at the end? And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. If you go to King James Version, if you want to get old school, it says the gates of hell will not overcome it. In other words, Jesus is saying, hey, this matters so much, this gift I'm going to give to you, which will then turn you into a gift. This is why this is important. It's important that you understand who I am and that you then live that out because who you become matters. This is why. Because the gates of hell are trying to overcome it. Did you hear it? Jesus wasn't saying, and the gates of hell shall not overcome it, and they're not even going to try. No, he says they won't overcome it. I know they're going to try. Day in and day out. And let me tell you, Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve, you want to know how that Satan works over time? It's going to be Christmas Eve. You know how many people who don't know Jesus will be in this room on Christmas Eve? You want to see the gates of hell work? You want to see them get after something? Christmas Eve is going to be that day. If there's someone in your life that needs to hear about Jesus, they need to be here. Christmas Eve. Which means that you get to be a part of the gift. Which means that automatically the gates of hell begin to work against you. They begin to work against your invitation. They begin to work against your convenience and the time you have to have a conversation. They're already working against you. The name that just popped into your head already, the gates of hell are attempting to overcome it. And Jesus is saying, hey, they can, they can do that. They can do that. But if that person really wants to find belonging and be connected and find purpose and calling, that the gates of hell stands no chance. Bring it, bring it on if you want to, but they have no chance. Arguably the greatest Christmas movie of all time, depending on who you ask, 70 or so percent of our people think so, at least that it could be qualified as a Christmas movie. Not sure it is a Christmas movie, but it's Die Hard. We'll show this picture. You know what I'm talking about? That's me. That's not me. But that's, that's you know what I'm talking about. You know what's happening there? He's crawling through the duct. There's this, there's this line. It's become pretty famous. I don't know if you know it. In fact, if you were to Google this or YouTube it, um, there's like 10 minutes of other movies and TV shows taking this line and using most of it. It's got a little bit of foul language on it, so I'm going to muffle your kids. I'm, gonna say, I'm not going to say it out loud. I'm going to say half of it. There, there's this moment, you know, where he's like trying to get his wife back. 
and he, he's, in, he's up against these, you know, these, these folks, and uh, they've got his wife held hostage, and they're trying to figure out who he is. And, like, uh, and then so Hans is on the radio. He's like, are you some cowboy? I don't know what kind of accent he's got, but are you some cowboy? And he's, you know, you John Wayne, this, that, and other. And he goes through this whole thing. And so he says, you think you really stand a chance against us? Just one guy against this entire mob. You think you stand a chance? Anybody know what he says? You have to edit it, edit it. <laughs> some of y'all are about to shout it out. This is my chance. Husbands were like, I can do it. I'm going to say it. This is yippee ki doesn't he? I think there's a moment where you just have to look the gates of hell in the face. And they're looking at you and saying, you think you stand a chance at becoming a gift in this world? You think you stand a chance at finding belonging in this world, the wreck that you are? You think you stand a chance at finding connection to God as wretched as you are? You think you stand a chance of finding a calling and a purpose connected to the kingdom of God? You think you stand a chance of becoming a part of the gift that keeps on giving? You think you stand a chance of becoming significant in the kingdom of God? And you just need to say, yippee ki and move on about your day. That's what we need. If you're a follower of Jesus, that needs to come out of your mouth today. You stare the gates of hell in the face. And yippee ki Because you will not overcome me or my Jesus or the purpose that I have to become a gift to the community because of the gift of Jesus.